Hello, everybody, and welcome. Great to have you back to our wonderful summit, Harness Your Creative Power. Our guest today is Zen Benefi. Hello, Zen. Great to have you here. Hi, Gunhild, and thank you very much. I, it's wonderful to be here. Mm -hmm. Zen, let me introduce you briefly, and if I forget something, please uh, come in and <laughs> add what you would like to add. First of all, you are a transformational life coach. And then I found something that I would like to read because it's interesting. You are a witty co-host. You are an adept problem solver. You are a digital creator. You, and you are a superb facilitator and trainer. So is there anything I forgot you would like to add? No, that was, that was great. That's uh, actually what I use on my LinkedIn profile. Okay. So <laughs> it kind of encapsulates everything. Mm -hmm. So then let me ask you, um, are you born this way or uh, how, how did you get there? How come you are doing what you are doing here today? Oh, uh, wow. Well, you know, I, I was orphaned at birth. So that was kind of a, an interesting start of, you know, and I didn't know about that until my adoptive parents who had adopted me when I was six weeks old. Um, when I was four and a half or thereabouts, um, they brought home my sister. They mm -hmm. adopted a girl. Okay. And so my parents felt at that time it was good for me to know what adoption was. And so that gave me some, even at that age, some very, maybe to some disturbing questions, you know, about who am I really and where did I come from? Why am I here? Um, what's adoption all about? Why did my parents abandon me? Right. And all that kind of stuff. So it, it came, it, it allowed me to go fairly deep, even as such a young boy um, to some questions that really took me down a rabbit hole that I'm continually spiraling down um, for my entire life, actually. Well, mm -hmm. So could I say, so this was the initiation, the, the beginning of your, your journey? Yeah, it, it really was. And the interesting thing uh, for me during that period, shortly after I found out, um, I was standing in the, uh, on the second level, second tier of our uh, two-story house it was a the landing of the staircase that went up and there was a window that looked out over the front porch and dad had gone to the store it was after dark and i you know got my elbows on the edge of the windowsill looking out over the front porch light was on uh, i could still see you know out there but and the main street in town it was a really small town with maybe six thousand people at the time and i was looking out over the porch just kind of waiting for him to return the main street was maybe, you know, 50, 60 feet away. And as I was positioned there, all of a sudden I hear this voice. And it was a really deep male voice, rather intimidating. And it just says simply, hey, you. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I paused for a moment and I thought, what the heck is going on here? And I spun around and mom was sitting not too far away down at the bottom of the stairs watching TV. And I said, Mom, Mom, did you hear that voice? And she says, what voice? And I said, that voice. It says, hey, you. And, you know, I realized that it wasn't the TV. But she says to me, no, I didn't hear a voice. Must have been a peeping Tom. You know, so I thought, yeah, no, <laughs> that, that wasn't so. And I realized that the voice came from inside of me. Somehow it was in my head mm -hmm. and nobody else could hear it but me. So it started up a conversation and I began to have a conversation with this voice and it would answer. And over the next year or so, I'd stand in front of the window, um, several windows in the house at night with the lights on inside. So I couldn't see out, you know, the, the light would reflect off the window and I would project out that same, Hey, you, and I would stand there and I would wait for it to return. Yeah. And it, 
it was a combination of sound and energy. Mm-hmm. So I'd hear the voice as, as at the same time I would feel this rush of energy coming back. And it was a way, I, I guess, for a young child to deal with that fear of the unknown. Mm-hmm. And so that's how I began understanding that there really wasn't a whole lot to fear except fear itself. Mm. And are you still in contact with this voice today? Yeah. Yeah, it, it comes in a lot of different forms, and there are others. Mm-hmm. You know, to, if I were to talk to somebody, you know, of a clinical persuasion, they might think I was a little nuts. But there are so many people that have this connection to other worlds and other beings and guides, allies, guardian angels, whatever you want to call them. Mm-hmm. There's a, an obvious connection that we have to some other intelligent source that we can develop. Yeah. Even though you say the voice was inside you, yeah, if mm-hmm. I'm you right. So uh, it, is, it is you or in you. Right. And, and, you know, in all the spiritual traditions, there are places where it talks about this inner knowing or inner yeah. voice or inner yeah. experience and uh, it's real yeah yeah most of us don't ever really trust it because we don't have people around us that support us doing so mm. and as you as you say uh, some people label it so then uh, so many people who have these voices or know this or know about the knowing don't talk about it because they don't want to be labeled. So it's, it's great that, to hear you that you talk about it this openly. Wonderful. <laughs> well, it's, it hasn't come without its challenges, let me tell you. Yeah, I can uh, believe you, yes. Um, but probably those challenges made you the man you are here today, I guess. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. So we need some challenges as well to, in order to grow. Yes. Okay, I look a little bit to my questions that I have prepared. Okay. And um, you say, or I read somewhere, if you want to hold the truth, have no opinion. Uh, so what is the truth? What do you see as the truth? How do you define truth? Well, you know, obviously it depends on the individual's frame of reference, I suppose, to begin with. You know, is it inner or outer? Is it from a belief or an open-mindedness, a suspension of belief, uh, you know, questions that we ask and they all have answers, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, Or is it the level of experience that we have that gives us a better understanding? For me, you know, truth bridges science and spirituality in most cases. And it's uh, kind of a sense really that resonates within my heart and mind simultaneously. Mm-hmm. Sometimes it even tingles throughout my entire body like a warm fluid descending from the top of my head and going down through my feet. And, Now, mm-hmm. where does it come from, I think, was, is your next question. <laughs> yeah, um, where does it come from? I can right. ask this. <laughs> okay. Um, so for me, it comes from a deep place, and I think it comes from a deep place within us all. And it resonates when we find it. It changes over time uh, based on our ability to ask more or even better questions and our level of understanding. Each question, of course, you know, it, it has the answer within it. And it always begs more questions, in my opinion. Mm-hmm. So when you say truth and opinion, so what is an opinion then in respect to truth. When I hear you with truth, you can feel it in your body. And right. You know and, and, you know, going back to the, um, the phrase you mentioned earlier, you know, I think it's actually the, in order to seek truth, one must have no opinions. It's come from, comes from a, an old Chinese philosopher, I think his name was Sin, it's H-S-I-N double, so it's Sin Sin Ming. Mm-hmm. And, I thought it was just really appropriate because in the process of finding truth, you really have to suspend your belief systems. You can hold no opinions. You have to ask the questions and then just be aware of what shows up and be very attentive to that, how you feel, what you think, the environment around you, the sounds, the people, 
how it's all reflecting to you. And, and, you know, initially your awareness is probably no, not all that great of all that, but as you begin to pay attention and you experience the process over time, it becomes more uh, poignant and relevant and present in your life. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and when I hear you, you trust this truth, you trust this knowing, or you, is this so, or how does it Well, work? you know, I think with, with any of us, when, when we start having weird experiences, we don't necessarily trust it to begin with, because mm -hmm. it's weird, it's odd, it's different. It, it's an unknown place in us. And the objective, I guess, over time is to learn how to trust it and to follow the promptings, to test it. You know, truth loves to be tested. How do you do that? How do you test it? Well, for, for instance, if you get an impression, you know, to go do something rather than just blow it off and think that eh, it's just my mind messing with me or whatever. You actually get up and go do what that prompting is. Mm -hmm. It may feel weird, strange, you know, like you're acting a little crazy, you know, because you're doing something that you have no idea what's going to happen, but you were, you had this sensation or a feeling or even, you know, you're told outright to go do this. Mm -hmm. And so you do. Mm -hmm. And so over time, by doing that on a continual basis, or at least semi-continual, maybe sporadic, you know, because it's not always consistent. You know, we have our, our daily lives and our activities exactly. that we're engaged in, mm -hmm. and these things may come in what many know as non-linear or non-local moments. It's kind of the, the bridge of science and spirituality where those quantum realities You know, Einstein calls it spooky action at a distance, right? Where quantum entanglement's involved. Mm -hmm. And we have those interactions. Mm -hmm. So those promptings could come in between words that we're thinking because they, they just pop in. And they're clear and present, especially when you begin to pay attention to them over time. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to add, like, uh, Jung calls it synchronicity, you know, when... Yes. When energies come together not in a non-linear way and there is some truth <laughs> right there or some knowing yeah. right there. Mm -hmm. And it's undeniable if we pay attention and acknowledge our experience. Mm -hmm. You know, it, the experience trumps belief systems always. Mm -hmm. We're set up, we have initial things that, you know, as we learn in, in Uh, as an educator, I, I taught high school for a number of years, too, and got some training in that college as well. But we, as uh, learners, were taught certain things initially. We, we have belief systems, values, ethics, morals, those kinds of things that we learn from our parents, from our school, from our friends, you know, the neighborhood, all those community, all those kinds of things. And so that's kind of the, the framework or the foundation that we begin to grow from. And then over time, as we question those and test the truth that is supposedly within them, then we learn better ways of negotiating reality based on the experience that we have. And sometimes it's necessary to chuck the belief and go with the experience because it's proven different. Yeah. Yeah. The belief is a belief. And an experience is an experience. Yeah. yeah. The belief is in the head, and an experience, as you say, can be can be felt, can be sensed, uh, can be perceived in many many different ways. Absolutely. Whereas, uh, a belief is is in is in the head. It's a thought. Now, one of the interesting questions that that you ask in your forum was was you know where is it located, right? Yeah. <laughs> And honestly, it's located wherever we find it. Mm -hmm. uh, all or at least some of our senses are involved in perceiving it in the moment it arrives. And there's a, what I have an experience of, it, it's a symbiotic click between inner and outer experiences. Mm -hmm. Now, depending on the level of awareness, signs of it can be as simple as noticing a sound or watching an insect, you know, being attracted to it, 
or an animal um, or a smell or a feeling, you know, a subtle thing like a prick to her skin or a quiver in a muscle or an awareness of a tingle or twitch somewhere in our body. Yeah. It might be a phone signaling a notification or something. You know, there's a lot of digital, since everything is electronic throughout the electromagnetic spectrum, we're all interconnected. And so with these digital devices, um, you know, sometimes we use different sounds, mm -hmm. right, that mean something different. And especially if you're a creative sort and, and you've learned how to work within this reality and creating it so that it actually serves you in some way because everything talks to us it just depends on our ability to listen and perceive yeah. can we train this do you think we can train to really oh absolutely absolutely we're born with it we all have the ability but it takes our attention focus discipline to be able to develop it over time yeah and take it seriously and stay open. Mm -hmm. yeah. Now uh, I come to creativity, uh, our subject here today. Mm, how do you define creativity? How would you define uh, being creative? Do you have a definition? Well, I, I, it's kind of, you know, it, it's a huge question, yeah. right? With innumerable answers. Okay, we have time. Okay. Well, I try to make things as I'm a great storyteller and I tend to draw things out. <laughs> so I'll try to, to synopsize. So I exercise creativity in nearly every situation I encounter. Um, being alert and alive as well as sensitive to its requirements of me and how willing I am to fully engage my creative capacity. And I don't always know what that's going to be. You know, it depends on the situation. I think everyone has that capacity within them to operate at a new level of challenging ourselves to grow and respond in ways that we feel are necessary, even when it might be a little intimidating. Mm -hmm. So, you know, as we mentioned earlier, every question has an answer. Creativity comes to order, if you will, in the expression of who we are fully in that moment and applying our inner and outer awareness of it. On a more simplified level, I suppose, it's my access and openness to making the moment better, or at least more than it could have been without my participation. As a coach, Mm -hmm. It's when a client's unspoken questions gets acknowledged and answered. And I share something new for them to consider that is perfect for them in that moment and facilitates what I call an evil leap in their awareness and functionality How in the world. Call it? How do you call it? Could you repeat? An evil leap. It's like an evolutionary leap. Okay. Okay. And creativity comes in the form fit and function of my presence in the moment, fueled by my ability to remain intimate and especially vulnerable to the inner promptings that come in service to others. Now, you know, I'm a musician, so as a drummer, improv being my favorite, it's what I can add that both edifies the other musician's parts and complements the conversation with unexpected fills and creativity that are perfectly timed. Rarely are they planned, right? It's just, it happens in a moment. So it's the creative spark that appears in that moment as the musical conversation is happening. Mm -hmm. And you are not blocked. Evidently, you are not blocked. You give in to those impulses. No, and, and it took me years to get to that place. You know, a, a lot of practice, a lot of discipline. And then it, it, I studied a lot of, of drummers and learned how to play like them. Sticking patterns weren't necessarily identical, but I could get the same sounds. And so as, as I developed my art, if you will, I learned how to be sensitive and listen to the rest of the musicians as they were playing. 
So it gave me a, a deeper sense, and, and being a cancer as well certainly helps being empathic. It, it, you kind of feel the flow, and you know where to go, and, and as long as you're not in your head thinking about it, it's flow. Mihaly, check that Mihaly uh, had a great book called Flow, The Psychology of the Optimal Experience. Yeah. And in that, he refers to that process mm -hmm. as being like a jazz quartet that's in the process of, of jamming, right? Time flies out the window, ego disappears, everybody becomes one, and it's just this wonderful conversation that takes place. Mm -hmm. You know, it's perfectly timed and synchronistic in every note that's played, even the space between the notes. Mm -hmm. So this is when you are making music together with others. And if I think of our, our listeners here, maybe mm -hmm. they do not have the chance to do something together with others. Is there something you could tell them how one can be creative or go into the flow by oneself? Oh, um, I, well, tools? You know, well, first of all, first of all, okay. I think it's necessary to really take inventory of your life uh, as you know it, right? Who you are, what you are, know who you are as much as possible and what you would like to accomplish, even if it's a wild dream mm -hmm. and, you know, you believe it can be made real. So you might have this wild idea step into it you know listen to yourself look at what you can do um hire a coach you know where you can talk about what your idea is and they can reflect back to you the possible actions that you can take or the the little steps that you can take towards the big goal because you know you start with the goal in mind like every you know well-known master of reality you know, says you got to start with the goal, with the end in mind. And then you bring the little details down to where you have actions that you can take daily, even hourly. Um, and sometimes even moment to moment, you have an idea of what you want to do and how to accomplish it. Accomplish it. And especially with a coach, you can lay things out in an action plan that you can see your results as you proceed through it. So you begin to develop a trust and a confidence in your own ability, which is really the root of that capacity that we have to perform. Mm -hmm. And right? would you say it takes courage uh, to go those steps? Oh, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Fearlessness. Fearlessness. How can, Fearless. we, access, how can we access fearlessness? Uh, well, you know, leaps of faith are called that for a reason. Mm -hmm. And in my understanding and experience, when you take a leap of faith, the universe supports it. Mm -hmm. There will be so many things and unexpected arrivals of people, places, and things that help you put your plan together and they're there to assist you. We, as creative beings, as uh, cosmic consciousness condensed into these bodies, really, we have this tremendous creative capacity that we rarely tap into because so many things and people around us try to tell us it's not there. But the, the greatest achievers don't pay any attention to that. They just, you know, they have an idea, they create a plan as loose as, or tight as it may be, and the details are filled in during the action that takes place in order to achieve it somehow. So this is one, one advice, maybe not to listen to all these critical voices from the outside. Yeah? And, and inside too. Because, and inside too, yes. Yeah, you know. We have a tendency to be very self-deprecating yeah. and very, you know, self-critical. Mm. And that's okay to a certain point because we need to have that, you know, the, the voice on each shoulder, right? And each one of them, believe it or not, has the same goal to get us to proceed. One of the things that I learned 
uh, in my religious studies, if you will, um, in the Kabbalah, there's the, I think it's the 36 greater and 36 lesser names of God. Well, a lot of times we see them as angels and demons. Angels support us, demons are there to deter us. Well, not really. We get the wisdom from one and we get tested on whether we got it from the other. Both of them have are one in the service to us so that we can achieve our mission, our purpose, our goals, our objectives, whatever it is that we're choosing to do. Mm -hmm. And maybe coming back to the very beginning of uh, our conversation, maybe get into communication with those demons or angels, yeah, if they are very critical to, to communicate with them, to negotiate yeah. with them. You know, it's just picking your dance tune, right? <laughs> and learning how to dance effectively, you know, with your light and your shadow. Yes. It's part of you. And, you know, it's best not to hold any judgment or opinions yeah. of yourself because they're going to change. You're going to grow. You're going to find new things about yourself. You're going to find your strengths and capitalize on them and your weaknesses will disappear. Yeah, and we have to be ready to make mistakes uh, and learn from them. Oh, yeah. If you're not making mistakes, you're not doing anything. Mm. Failures are part of success. It just goes with the program. Mm. And to see the failures not necessarily as failures, but as stepping stones or... or um, you know, steps on the path in your own ascension. Mm. You know, like Edison, what did he say? Um, you know, I didn't fail making the light bulb. I just found 99 ways not to do it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, indeed. Um, is there a, a ritual or a practice you uh, practice or you could suggest to our listeners um, something we can do like meditation or something in order to uh, get back to ourselves and trust ourselves? Is there something you can suggest in this respect? Oh, actually, you know, there's many things that I do and have done over the years. I have tried so many different practices just to see which ones fit for me. Yeah. And I, I, would encourage, I, I would encourage others uh, to do so, to, you know, explore everything. Um, everything that you are attracted to will have some nugget of truth for you that you can make your own and take with you. That it's not going to be everything in that belief or, you know, system or whatever, because nothing's meant to really satisfy everything in you. There's those nuggets that you find within it that you can take with you. Now, some of the stuff, you know, it's more disciplined than others, but um, I, I experiment still. And at my age, I really don't care, right? <laughs> um, now my, yes, so yeah. do I, <laughs> of course. Right, right. It now, never my fiancé and I, we, we practice some things together. Um, some of the things are physical, like holding the plank position for a few minutes or practicing Tai Chi or doing yoga. Mm -hmm. you know, a, um, actually a, a kundalini yoga teacher so that's how we met was at her graduation All right. um, mm -hmm. so and, you know in essence I do what I'm prompted to do as I explore myself in the moment of availability mm -hmm. and it's a really it's a free place to operate in that most of us don't give ourselves the opportunity to do so mm -hmm. we think we should be this or that. And so we manage our behavior accordingly. And I have a tendency to just let it rip wherever I am. And sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes there's laughs, sometimes there's scowls. Um, I don't care. You know, I, if I feel good about who I am and what I'm doing, it'll affect the right people around me and those that resonate will be attracted and those that don't, I won't have to worry about. They're gone. Mm. <laughs> yeah. 
Mm. Now, one of the things that I found uh, is profound, and it's so simple that it's almost ridiculous. I put my fingers together, mm -hmm. just like this, and I feel my heartbeat. I breathe, and I just concentrate on feeling my heartbeat. And you know what happens? You get out of your mind. It gets quiet because you're feeling your heartbeat. Now, what all is your heartbeat connected to? That's your life pulse, right? In deep meditation and in experiences of other worlds, um, inner planes, if you will, one of the things I've found most consistent is that when you're really deeply listening, there's a pulse that, that's the foundation of it. So it's like this um, universe, bio-spiritual, mechanical pulse that's in everything. So there's a structure, mm -hmm. right? Now, in the process of that, um, we learn, you know, kind of how to have a mental focus as well as allowing your body to do what it knows, right? So there's um, both a, a mental and physical, emotional uh, memory, if you will, that happens over time. And if you practice even this simple, you can do it anywhere, right? Nobody knows. <laughs> you can just put your fingers, you know, put your hands in your lap and you can be in a you know, high stress meeting that you can be in the middle of a corporate boardroom, which I have, um, and put your fingers together and, and feel that pulse and breathe. And it only takes three or four breaths once you've practiced it that allows you to really get calm and centered and be able to perform at your peak. Mm -hmm. And even for the creative process, I can imagine um, to practice uh, something like this or any other uh, kind of meditation, I would call it meditation, don't know how you call it, even to calm down. You know, <clears throat> that's probably the most universal term that's used for that. Mm -hmm. Meditation can encompass a lot of different practices. Yeah. Mm -hmm. This helps also to, to focus and calm down in order to access also the, the, the creative side if somebody wants to to come up with inspiration or ideas, I can imagine that the, what you just described with the pulse helps and enables people also to access this creative source that's inside. Right. Mm -hmm. Now, conversely, once you're able to practice that for a while and, and you're able to learn how to manage that in your life, then that it expands into all of your activity. And, and even for instance, when I'm playing drums and I'm, it looks like I'm just frantic as heck with the sticks going everywhere and hitting the cymbals and drums and, you know, doing all this kind of stuff. I'm still in that place inside because I'm not in my mind. Mm -hmm. I'm allowing that free flow of energy yeah. to be present. And if we really knew the truth of it all, our heart consciousness, which is connected to everything in our body, is more present, alive, and available than the intelligence that we carry in our intellect. Mm -hmm. You know, the whole thing about um, the longest journey being 18 inches, right, from here to here. When the two are connected, magic happens. The thing that I've found, and you probably have recognized too, that most people live from here up. They are completely unaware of what's going on in their body, how it feels, what it's telling them, the indications, you know. Uh, it's a sensory device. It's a transceiver. Mm -hmm. yeah. And as we said before, we can train this. We can train to be aware of it, yeah? Or we yeah. can remind ourselves wherever we are, whenever we are somewhere, to feel it, to feel, to get back into our body. And yes. I like, I like your, uh, your hands or your pulse, uh, which will help us to get back into the body. And, and <laughs> you know, I stumbled upon that 
uh, not on the website. Okay, the web wasn't even present yet when, when I found this. I, I was in college and I was having a very frantic day. Um, I'd had uh, an experience that, um, well, maybe it's a good time to kind of um, talk about the transformation that I went through. Yeah. Yes. But early on, I had one as a child. Then as a teenager, my first year of college, I was in a pre-med program at uh, Ball State University, which was in Muncie, Indiana, which is also where Close Encounters of the Third Kind started. And if you're familiar with David Letterman, that was his college as well. Okay. <laughs> so it wasn't too far from where I grew up. So I uh, had gone home for quarter break. It was my first quarter. And I had went to ask my high school girlfriend to marry me. And I found out that she was already married. And it just devastated me. So I went back to school and I hit my knees and I prayed. And basically my prayer was, you know, I talked to Heavenly Father, you know, as a child and, and a teenager, I was raised in a Christian environment. So I was like, Father, you know, um, I want to know what truth is. And I'm willing to die for it if necessary. Mm-hmm. And it was probably the most fervent, centered, deep prayer that I have ever made. And <laughs> lo and behold, be careful what you ask for, right? Yes. <laughs> so the following week, I came back from school and, and in the afternoon and I usually, you know, had a rest period before hitting the books. So I put on an album, Journey's first album, and I laid across my dorm room bed. I lived in the honors dorm and listened to this album. And during the second song, it was called In the Morning Day. Uh, and by the way, if you Google messy antic complex, you'll find some articles and maybe even a video of a presentation I gave at the International Association for Near-Death Studies in Denver in 2010. It's kind of cool. So I'm laying there in between the vocals and the jam in the song, this voice I've been familiar with since a a child calls me by my given name. Uh, Zen hadn't shown up yet. says, Bruce, are you willing to die for what you believe in? Well, after I butt puckered, you know, that's kind of a spooky thing. I thought to myself, okay, what do I believe in? Uh, um, Christ consciousness Mm, still felt a little empty for some reason. I didn't question it. I just moved on. My next thought was cosmic consciousness. And immediately I had this, yes. And as soon as I said, yes, there was a guitar riff that sounded like this really, you know, fast moving object, kind of like a jet that just went right past me. And so I left my body with that. I'd had plenty of out of body experiences, so it wasn't spooky at that time, but I left my body and I turned around to look at my body laying across my dorm room bed and then turned back to look where I was going. And before I could get turned around fully, I was engulfed by white light. It was the most amazing feeling I have ever had. I mean, it felt like home in in ways that I still find indescribable. Mm -hmm. And yet, all it was was white light. So after this impetuous teenager, right, I was 18 at the time, I realized that, okay, I can think, so I'm not dead. I can see, even though all I'm seeing is white light, I have no body. There's no tactile sensation. And so my next question was, wow, is there more? And I feel movement. And the next thing that I see is this, it's like a starscape of pinpoints of light that's surrounding me with an indigo background. And before I could even get the question fully formulated of what are these, I knew that they were points of consciousness. Whether in body or not, I wasn't sure because I knew I wasn't. But there was this sense that they were in body somewhere. Right? So as I thought this, then the voice picked back up and said verbatim. I still remember it to this day because it was that vivid. 
for me. These are those that you are to work with in order to facilitate a new world order. It will happen in your lifetime. Know this to be true. Your path will be full of trials and tribulations. Have faith and trust that everything you need will be there at its appointed time. Trust and allow. Mm. And then I felt another rush of energy and I'm back in my body taking a gulp of air. Now, as an 18 year old with virtually no kind of spiritual experience, what the heck do you do with that? Mm. You know, did I die? I, I was asked, I, did I, you know, and so I, I spent well, probably the next month and every moment that I could in the library looking up anything that would have anything to do with the death experience or near death experience. And that was the closest that I could find. Mm -hmm. And that got me reading Raymond Moody's stuff. And it all made, you know, sense, but yet it was different than any of the other experiences that I read about because no trauma was involved. It was completely volitional. Mm -hmm. And you call this transformation. Uh, that's how we started out when you said uh, this was the second or third transformation. Um, it transformed you, this experience? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. And it made my life hell. It made your <laughs> life hell? Song. Right. You know, well, I mean, think about it. When, if you were, and I was a big mouth, a flower mouth at the time, I had to talk to everybody about what was going on. And of course, I didn't think about it because I didn't feel this way about myself. But when you say that kind of thing to somebody, they immediately think, well, what? You think you're the one? You think you're the Messiah? You know, you think you're all that? Mm -hmm. And I never even thought about that because I never considered it. You know, the words were facilitate, work together, mm -hmm. right? So my whole life, I, I've been one that, loves to get people together to do cool stuff. Mm -hmm. And sometimes I'm a leader, sometimes I'm a facilitator, sometimes I'm just a worker bee, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. But in that process, I told my parents what had happened. Yeah. And they were scared. Mm -hmm. And probably rightfully so. Mm -hmm. So they had me see a psychiatrist and what a godsend you know the the guy's name was dr abel and boy did he have a ring of truth he listened to me for three sessions i asked all the the deep questions that were necessary and kind of you know poked hole tried to poke holes in my experience to find out if i was really sane or not and of course i was unaware of all this i was just having a conversation with him and i thought it was really cool because it seemed like he was listening and not trying to judge me. Yeah. But after, um, during the, uh, towards the end of the third visit, he says to me, you know, Bruce, I got to tell you, you're not crazy. Um, I don't understand it, but you've got all the signs of a spiritual awakening. Most people from my understanding don't go through it until their mid forties, mm -hmm. if they ever do. So for you to go through it so young is an anomaly in the system. Mm -hmm. and I don't understand why, but maybe I can help you to at least feel comfortable and learn how to deal with it. To integrate it, to integrate it into your life as well. Right, right, which is really, you know, he's not going to change my experience. He's not going to change what happened, but he can help me adapt and learn how to deal with it and integrate it yeah. into a daily experience that's yeah. functional <laughs> with the world as it is, yes. which is the most important thing. Absolutely. So he says to me, he says, okay, I, I want to show you something. And, and he says, well, come here. And he gets up and, and he had his office in an old historic home, two story um, in downtown Anderson, Indiana. And we walk up the stairs and there's a door to the right at the top of the stairs. He opens the door up and my heart chakra just, it, and I didn't understand chakras at the time. Or I knew of them, but I didn't really understand how they worked. 
but my heart just exploded with this warm pulse. And I'm like, wow, that was weird. And I look at him and I look into the room and there's all kinds of, of bookshelves and posters and things hanging from the ceiling and on the walls. And they were all the, I guess, a metaphysical nature. Mm -hmm. and right inside the door there was a card table with a deck of tarot cards on it and I understood what those were and I look at them and I look at him and he says you know what those are and I said yeah they're tarot cards and he said you know what they're for and I said yeah they're you know you ask questions and you do a spread and you get answers that's kind of the basics right and he said well have you ever had your cards read mm -hmm. and I said no. And he says, would you like to? <laughs> I, yeah, buddy. You know, so, I mean, this is, I'm thinking to myself, here's a psychiatrist, a medical doctor trained in clinical practices that's so open, it's unbelievable. And I'm like, okay, let's dive into this. So he, we sat down and, and he does the spread and he tells me so many different things about my life that I had not shared with anybody. And at the end of it, he kind of scratches his head and he says, you know, I really don't know what to do about this. This is amazing. Um, about the only thing that I can really say to you is keep your mouth shut. Yeah. Nobody is going to understand the wisdom that you carry. Mm -hmm. And that was not easy for me to do. And I don't think I really did. I, like I said, I, I have a habit of opening my mouth regardless. And if something's there to speak, I'm going to speak it. <laughs> and it may not always bode well, you know, from my own experience or the perception of others in it. Um, but there's always those, you know, that one or two yeah. that gets it yeah. and may respond to me either in that moment or yeah. at another time. Yeah. When, yeah, wonderful to hear you. Uh, two things that came to my mind. One thing is that psychiatrists are human beings as well. So Absolutely. Here you, and they're yeah. just as different as, as you and I in our yeah, and, and evidently uh, you met a psychiatrist who was trained in psychiatry and who was very clearly an open human being. So uh, just to underline that. And then a question comes to my mind, uh, listening to you, do you think that we come with a purpose? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. And, you know, uh, I think as for the most part, all right, or maybe at worst, We're here to learn how to get along. Uh, to get along in what way? What do you mean to get along? To, to go through life or? To get along with ourselves, okay. each other, our community, the world. You know, there's a form, fit, and a function that we each have that bring us into harmony. Mm -hmm. And, you know, um, It's a, or maybe at best, right? It's achieving a new living awareness that goes beyond anything we've imagined in our inner workings mm -hmm. with the inner worlds and the outer worlds mm -hmm. here on the planet and beyond in some cases. Because so there are those things, right? Mm -hmm. So here's kind of a 30,000 foot view, if you will. We're five years on the other side of 2012. That was a big deal, 2012, for a lot of people, right? There's all kinds of theories and conspiracies and, you know. Yeah, because of the Mayan calendar, yeah. Right. Well, Jose Arguez, who, who brought out the calendar initially, was a good friend. Mm -hmm. Wonderful man. Had some great discussions with him. Um, now, so 2012 actually was a tipping point in this 50-year window. Mm -hmm of the transition between the Piscean age and the Aquarian age. And the first 25 years was an accelerated learning curve, almost like the information curve that we see that's almost straight up now. Our awareness and understanding of ourselves, our connectivity, the universe, 
quantum realities, you know, all those kinds of things. And all you got to do is just look at the books and CDs and materials and authors and speakers and all that kind of stuff and movies. There's evidence, right? A blind or a, a, an insensitive, unaware person could ask the question and then just take a look and see everything. <coughs> Excuse me. So what's on the other side of 2012? What, what happens after the tipping point? <clears throat> it's applying the awareness back into the existing systems, mm -hmm. right? That bring us to a point where we're making the world a better place. And eventually, even with the, what I was told as a teenager, you know, the new world order would happen in my lifetime. I don't know if it's going to happen before I'm 80 or before I'm 120 or maybe I'll live to be 300 like some have. I don't know. You know, these are things, these are questions that all I do is believe, I guess, and, and understand that that possibility exists and remain open to it. Mm -hmm. Now, each of us has a role to play, right? Mm -hmm. Equally mm -hmm. as important as the next. Nobody's above or below. You know, we just have different functions. And I suppose in the purest sense, you know, we might see it as God dwelling in man again, right? We're told we're made in that image or the image of them, right? Them. Uh, I eventually understood this concept of being as cosmic consciousness condensing into form and becoming aware of this being reflected in our awareness of oneness, all that is and all we are as one. The result, according to the narrator within, right, is a sense of oneness and willingness to operate free from intellectual pursuits driven by the desire to dominate the environment, including people, places, and things. Now, each individual soul consciousness has purpose, like a thread in the tapestry of life that is just as important as any other thread. The beauty of the tapestry is dependent on the threads, no matter the color, diameter, or length. And when all the threads become aware of the tapestry, not just each other, right? It becomes alive and whole, able to be viewed. Individuals are kind of like fractals of yeah. the tapestry, able to contain the original, yet finding form, fit, and function within it as their own filaments combine to form the whole. Okay, so if I may say that there is a purpose for us as humankind and there is an individual purpose in the, pet, in the big purpose of humankind, if I hear yeah. you. Yeah. Now, it, it's, it's probably much more simple than, you know, we tend to, uh, as intellectual beings, right, as thinkers, uh, which is kind of funny because I read one time in uh, uh, one of those thick dictionaries in the, library at the at Ball State University. I, for some reason, wanted to research the name Satan and see where it actually came from. Well, one of the references was from the Greek, Phaeton, T-H-E-T-A-N, which means thinker. Oh, okay. So it, it's kind of, you know, a little twisted, know. but it makes sense. And I'm all about making sense common, right? Mm -hmm. So understanding that, um, it gives us the opportunity to look at life simply without good or bad, just how we think about it. And that the simplicity of finding our path is right in front of us. We have a set of skill sets that we've developed over our lifetime, right? We don't have to throw them away. They're there for a reason. We were, if, if we can look at things, even though we might not be aware of it during our lifetime, we're led through certain situations and education and learning and getting skill sets and developing, you know, talents and skills. All of that's applicable. And so when we get to that place that Dr. Abel was talking about in our mid forties, right? I didn't understand it at the time, but um, being on the other side of 
raising children. I've got four kids, nine grandkids, and, and one great grandchild so far. Wow. Um, <laughs> so, the uh, as a great grandfather, I have immense wisdom. All right. <laughs> so, in the process of the empty nesters, right? Once your children, you your purpose is to raise your children. Not everybody has them, but for the most part, right? We raise our children, and in the mid forties, they leave. They go off and do their own thing. So we're left with, okay, uh, what do I do now? Right? And so that's the opportunity that a lot of people have to begin to say, okay, what am I really here for? What are my passions? Um, what's my mission? What, do I have one? Is there a purpose? You know, ha having all those questions and then yeah. begin to develop the questions that, lead you to the answers mm -hmm. of what you're here to do, you know, where your passions are, what your purpose may be, and you begin to attract others around you and conversations happen where you can begin to share yes. and feel more comfortable in those places where you feel vulnerable, right? And, and you can let go of the fears that you have and talk more openly about what's going on inside mm -hmm. to people that might have the same thing going on. Yeah. And any counselor would tell you that it's not the questions that they ask you or the reflections that they give. It's you hearing yourself talk because mm -hmm. there's another sense that's involved in the listening. Mm -hmm. It's like your observer. Yeah. listening to yourself and giving you feedback mm -hmm. instantly as you're talking about what's going on inside of you. It's an amazing process. Yes, it is. Zen, it's... Did that uh, answer your question? Pardon? <laughs> yes. I said, did that answer your I question? Could, I could continue and go on and go on and go on. Um, we have to slowly come to an end of our this lovely conversation. Uh, before we stop, I would like to ask my last question. Is there something you would like to um, give a message uh, to give to our listeners here? A message from you personally to everybody who is watching and listening today? Great question. Well, first of all, have dreams believe in their reality and your ability to achieve them. There's a process for everything. You can learn it. You can transform your life with some simple things too. And it doesn't have to be so complex. Relax, take it easy. <laughs> you know, look for those who've gone where you want to go and ask them how they got there. Take what feels applicable to your life And forget the rest. Make it your own and continue to ask better questions of how you can find better form, fit, and function in your own life, whatever your purpose or goal. That's wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, uh, thank you for being here for, for us today and thank you for this wonderful conversation we had. And thank you, everybody, for listening and for watching. And see you soon. See you next time. Before Bye. we go, before we go, Gunhild, yes. there's one more thing that I think that you wanted to bring up, and that's my gift to everyone. Oh, I, yes. Oh, good. You. Everybody is still there. I almost <laughs> forgot about the gift. <laughs> then you remind me then, uh, what is your gift? It's so easy to do, huh? We, we have so many things to give, like we often forget to do so. Yeah, well, great. Thank you for yeah. reminding me. Oh, you're welcome. Um, sometimes I, I can remain focused. You know, we, we get in these conversations, they just go everywhere. Yeah. Um, so my gift to you and the audience is a downloadable copy of one of my books. I've got 18 of them on Amazon. Um, this book particularly is, is a collection It's filled with tasty tidbits of thought-provoking transformative practices. It's wow. called Transformation, a guide for change. And I put many things that were most effective for me through several decades of seeking truth while holding as few opinions as possible. So there's many exercises, there's journaling, there's instructions, there's um, a lot of resources there. 
And you can get your copy at Be The Dream, spelled out B-E-T-H-E-D-R-E-A-M, forwards dot com, forward slash change. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. And uh, you will also find uh, the... The, the reference on the side here. So don't worry, you will receive the wonderful gift, uh, Zen's wonderful gift. All the information will be on the side. So and if now, you wanna know more, don't be afraid to Google me. I'm everywhere. Uh, <laughs> I've got a lot of collections on zenbenefield.com and uh, you'll be surprised at what you might find. And who knows, it might just give you those tasty tidbits you need in that moment. Yeah. Indeed. So, um, one more time. Thank you for being here, everybody. Thank you for being here, Zen. And see you soon. Bye-bye. Thank you so much. And thank you.